Hello there, listeners and viewers. To episode, welcome to episode forty-six. Yeah, it's these, yeah, some pod vidcast, bid, pid, episode vidcast. Yeah. So here we are. We're in my home. We're in Dan's home. It's the muggiest. It's like the Amazon rainforest in uh, Warbird Academy right now. So hot and our very hours humid. have shifted. So we're training people from nine thirty to one thirty, and then we have a three-hour gap from one thirty to four thirty. Uh, and so we we're gonna podcast there, which would mean closing the garage door, so we don't get interrupted. Which would basically just be like locking yourself like in, a, in a sauna. <laughs> Death sentence. <laughs> yeah. This podcast is getting long. So it uh, gets yeah, it gets so humid in Warbird so fast. And one of the things, like, so we have the artificial turf, obviously over most of our facility, and that's where uh, we do a lot of sled pushing. And when it gets really humid, the sled grips to the turf and it like pulls the turf off the ground. It was happening a bunch today, but it's just like miserable it's not in ideal. there. I'd rather it be. Well, everyone says this, but I'd rather be really, really hot and not humid than kind of hot and really humid. And today's like kind of hot and really humid. And then you just sweat and it just sticks, it stays to you. Nothing happens. It doesn't evaporate. Yeah. My first lesson was at nine and at 9.15, I'm like, I'm like oddly sweaty for only being awake for like 15 minutes. Well, I was awake at 6.30, but um, I was just like, why am I this gross already? It just didn't take long. So anyway. And And then once you start sweating... At 9 o'clock in the morning, you don't stop until 8.30 at night. Correct. So here we are. Here uh, we are. My home. Yeah. Air conditioning. Although the air conditioner, I have a huge window unit. I have like a apartment with a big, like great room. It's a one bedroom apartment. And that thing is very loud. It's irritating. So we're going to start to sweat here regardless soon. Actually, probably not. It's pretty cool now. Yeah, that's not bad. I had like a mid, mid-afternoon thunder shower. Plus, I've got my carrot juice straight from the bottle like a heathen. Refreshing carrot juice. And, uh, so I guess we'll get through this. Wash it down with some refreshing carrot juice. Gross. So a um, little bit of a improvised show today. <sighs> yeah, yeah. What's what's new? Off in the case. Uh, yeah. But we're going to talk, number one, about first and thirds a little bit. Yeah. Should we talk about, should we recap our trip to Milwaukee at all? Is that worth talking about? Sure. So we just got back from the All-American Games in Franklin, Wisconsin, at a facility called the Rock Sports Complex, which does MLB replicant fields. Fields, not replicant. Those or, are those are human clones <laughs> designed to mine foreign planets. They're like uh, movie Blade Runner. So not quite a replicant, they're but made replica to, sounds good. Replica, yeah. Um, what do you think of the Rock Sports Complex? Uh, I thought it was a nice, average complex. Yeah. I think the replica thing was a joke. They just uh, do I should, like I shouldn't say a joke. It just. It was like a standard fence with the black like windscreen on it. Mm-hmm. You literally couldn't tell any of the contours of the field because of just the way it is. You have to have the padded, like the padded walls, like the big league kind of walls, to have any feel for the contours of the outfield. They all just looked like the same exact field. They all looked the same. So it was a really nice complex. We had a good time. It was a well-run tournament. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't have said it was a joke because it wasn't. But uh, as far as like the whole replica thing, it looks cool from the sky- from like the Google Maps satellite view. You're like, oh, that's interesting contour. Yeah. You literally couldn't tell anything when you're there, so it was kind of disappointing. Where is it like there's a complex uh, in, near my house in Maryland in Aberdeen, which is the Ripken complex by the Aberdeen Ironbird Bird Stadium, and they have some very legit replica fields there, like a warehouse in the outfield, all padded walls. I mean, those things are the real deal as far as like little mini replica fields go. But these ones, again, they're really nice. They're well-maintained. The grass in the outfield was good. They were turf infield. The gra- uh, I thought the grass good, in the outfield was really nice. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, they were great fields, but the replica thing, their execution of it didn't really work. That's all. Yeah. And they had, they had Phillies, Giants, but, uh, Red Sox, and I don't know who the fourth one was. I don't know who it was. But the, the coolest one was Fenway because they had a semi kind of green monster. It was a gray chain link fence, but it was just really tall, so it was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so the tournament went well, and then uh, I had not spent – much time in Milwaukee before. I think I had been there once briefly when I was younger, but uh, never as an adult and then never for an extended period of time. And we actually had some time to go out a little bit around town, and it was really really pretty awesome. I like Milwaukee yeah, a lot. I like Milwaukee too. I was impressed by it. It seemed very clean, uh-huh. uh, very safe, all the, all the neighborhoods that we were in and downtown and the Upper East Side and Third Ward. So And like a lot yeah. of different – yeah, a lot of different uh, restaurant and bar options and then – I mean, it's right on the lake, and there are like little rivers that cut through Milwaukee. So it's pretty pretty cool. There are a lot of spots because I was with McLean, your assistant coach, on one of the nights, and I was like, McLean, all I want to do 
is find a spot because it was a it was the weather was amazing all weekend. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I just want to find a spot where we can sit outside, drink a beer, and enjoy. Like it was like seventy five degrees probably at night. It was just yeah. like perfect. Um, and there's about a gajillion <clears throat> different places on the water to do that, so it was pretty pretty cool. Yeah, and people kept saying that it was like a mini Chicago. I'm like, that is sound, that's kind of annoying. It's like okay, but it actually kind of was kinda like, is, the way yeah. the river cuts through it. Um, it really did feel like a, a Chicago, but a lot smaller. So I get it. I don't. I don't know. Well, I was resistant to that. Yeah. Well, it just, I don't know. It's kind of like. Yeah. No, it really was, and I thought it was. Cool. Yeah, I, I thought it was a nice city. It was very, uh, like a homey feeling mm-hmm. city. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. You could live in the city and not feel like you're going to get mugged so much, or you just felt like you're in, and you're like in a mile walk from pretty much. Anywhere. Yeah, and everything felt really, cl- really close too. Mm-hmm. Like I was. We stayed at an Airbnb and then later stayed at a hotel after like the tournament was over. And I was sitting in a shop and like looked at an actual picture of Milwaukee after I had been there for a little bit and I knew where stuff was. And I was like, oh, our Airbnb was like right there and I'm right here. It was like all super close, which was cool. Yeah. So, yeah, Milwaukee was good. My team, uh, we again played 14U baseball. Mm-hmm. So, like, mm-hmm. good at times, really crappy at times. Uh, I had to address one major thing, which was outfield positioning, which I hadn't thought would ever be an issue. But um, in, a, in a critical part, part of one of our games where we were down 4-2 to two to the team that eventually won it, like by far the strongest team except for us, a uh, routine fly ball with I think a runner on – it was like 4-2 to two in that inning. So here's, here's the backstory. It was 4-2. to two. We brought in our, our first relievers the sixth inning. It was second and third, and no one out. Uh, so it's like, okay, what's the infield situation here? We have a very strong arm shortstop. We have a very small second baseman who just is waiting to grow. So I was going to concede the run if the ball is at the second base. First and third were in. I put my shortstop halfway. And we had talked about the halfway infield defense a bunch as a team because it's, it's a kind of unique defense, and you don't see that much. But it gives, depending on the player, it gives them an option of not being all the way pinched in where their defensive range is vastly reduced, uh, but also gives them an option to do a couple different things. So in this case, it was just to give him a little more range where he could make an extra, you know, play a couple extra steps either direction, um, or maybe a little blooper doesn't fall in quite as quickly behind him. So for him, the, the goal was hard ground ball, go home medium ground ball, which would otherwise, uh, if he played back, result in a conceded run, also goes home with. And then even a weak ground ball, if he's quick enough to it, if he gets a good break on it, he could still go home. So he can potentially get an out on three different ground balls and have a little more range than normal. And it's worth mentioning that you were playing on turf. We were on turf. So sure enough, they hit a two-hop, like cherry hop ground ball, Tim at short, you know, we yell, take it, take it, and he goes home, gets the out. Great. So that worked out really well. Um, so now we have a runner on first and third and one out. And a fly ball, out number two, was lofted to right field. And as I it leaves the bat, I'm like, okay, great. Uh, my right fielder is going to run 25 feet to his right into the right center gap and catch that. It's a can of corn. You know, wasn't hit right at him, but it should have been caught. And I turn, and my outfielder is literally nowhere to be seen. Like, I couldn't, I didn't know where he was. And then I find him, he's almost on the warning track in the corner. So, very frustrated. Uh, that ball falls in. So, run scores, guy goes to third. Uh, that inning eventually got extremely messy because of that. Mm. We would have recorded the third out, I think, of the next hitter or the hitter thereafter. So, it would have still been close enough game. Instead, the floodgates kind of went open and we got blown out. So, I just never, it just never occurred to me that I have to like constantly monitor that these kids, for whatever reason, get in their heads like this advanced positioning stuff and mm-hmm. i told him after the game and i was angry you know like i can't monitor your positioning on every single pitch so you're not allowed to wander off like you're not a, I, I can't is this where i use herd of cats no <laughs> i don't know herding cats but i'm like look i as a coach like i'm focused on a, a certain part of the field every time not even if i want to get your attention in the outfit i can't do it automatically i'm not yelling out there constantly um but it's it's fascinating watching young outfielders, or at least maybe maybe it's only my team. I'm positive it's not. No. They just like end up like all right. So for example, a kid hit a home run the first inning against us. The game started off line drive, line drive. Uh, was it, what was it? Line drive, line drive, home run, line or no three line drives and a home run. 
they played four runs very quick. Yeah, I think I heard four, it wasn't four, a grand, four runs and six pitches. It, it wasn't like a that. grand slam. It was a two-run shot, I think, or I don't know. Regardless, uh, so for that kid who hit the home run, for the rest of the game, my left fielder was playing, like, basically his back on the fence. So after the game, I asked him, like, look, how many of you guys have hit two doubles in a game this year? One kid raised his hand, and I have a pretty good hitting team. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, so only one time has a guy on our team who's hit a double hit a second double. Don't you feel like that probably probably applies to most players on this team? So if a guy hits a home run early or he hits a a double early, do we really need to play as if he's Barry Bonds for the rest of the game? No. And I said, if you look at a minor league field, and if you look at one, especially later in the summer, you will see three patches of like kind of dying grass in center field, one in right field, one in left field, where – the, all the outfielders from every team pretty much wears out the same spot because you know as an outfielder you play the same spot plus or minus maybe five steps in each direction no matter like what level you play at pretty much mm-hmm. so but apparently young players they get it in their head like oh I'm gonna go 45 feet this way because I have an inkling that he's gonna hit a double <laughs> right. opposite field over my head and I guess that was what happened in this situation we talked about it. it's not a big deal anymore but it just, like, never occurred to me that I had to, like, constantly monitor the outfield, that my outfielders might be wildly out of position, like 25 feet in the wrong spot. Uh, and so, obviously, we, like, had to talk about that. And they are they have very clear directions now to not move from a standard right field spot. And we talked about it before the field. I'm like, look, we're not going to play super deep playing for preventing doubles over our heads. We're going to, like, most teams just hit the ball in front of us. And even that team, they were a good hitting team. They barreled a bunch of balls up in the first inning. For the rest of the game, they hit line drives just over the infield mm. and, like, flares over the infield. They had, like, one legitimate double the rest of the way. Which that kid who hit the bomb hit a line drive single to left field in his yeah. next at-bat. Yeah, you know, so um, it just was interesting. And then even then, you know, our left fielder, every time one of the two, three, four hitters came out there, like, super far back. It's like we're not playing the percentages. They're not going to crush over your head that often where it matters that much. So – that was a, a learning experience for me, but it was just strange. I'm like, what are you basing this on? Like, how many – and the other thing is our right fielder. You know, most hitters are right-handed. It's like, what are you basing playing so deep to right field? Like, has there been an opposite field ball hit over your head all season? I, like, I can't remember one, really. Right. How many kids have the power to go apo taco to the r- right field warning track? We, we, almost uh, nobody. Our, like, our, literally both our, almost no one. I was going to say, both of our teams might get done with an entire season and not happen once. It hasn't happened to us yet. I would imagine we're both going to finish and not have a ball get hit over our right fielder's head. Yeah, from, like a, from a right-handed batter. Right, I know right, my, right, right, my right. team has actually two kids that are pretty strong, and one of them has kind of been on his front foot. He actually has hit an opposite field double. Uh, but that's just still just extremely yeah. rare. I mean, even the big leagues, you talk about – like you listen to Zach Granke talk about – Pitching inside versus outside. He had an article in Fangraphs.com a long time ago, and he was like, "Look, even in the big league level, when I make really good quality pitches on the outside third of the plate or black of the plate, there's not enough guys in the big leagues who can drive that pitch over my right fielder's head. They can hit it hard potentially because mm-hmm. they're major league hitters, but hitting it hard 315 feet isn't going to get over their head. You know, like they're going to line out to my right my right fielder a lot, and I'm going to take my chances out there." rather than going in on a guy who can just demolish a pitch if I miss. So, like, there's some – like, obviously, I believe heavily in pitching inside and all that, and Granky's an incredibly smart, you know, amazing pitcher. But, uh, you know, that, that rationale makes a lot of sense. Like, mm-hmm. I don't believe in going away, away, away all the time. I, I do not. But at the same time, he's absolutely right. Even the majors, the amount of guys that can hit a well-located outside pitch and drive it over an outfielder's head are very, very small. The opposite field home runs you see – or outer half, usually, mm-hmm. outer third, you know, sometimes. Like, legitimately on the corner, it's much less than, than people think that it is. Those, they still happen because big leaguers are freaks of nature. But right. 14-year-old kids are not. I mean, how many of them can drive a ball that far? They can barely drive it that far when they pull it. So, right. yeah, that was an interesting part of my weekend. Yeah, and we played uh, – my team played three games really, really well, and then – wheels came off in our last game which has been a reoccurring theme like we'll just well this weekend was good because typically we'll play like our first two games of uh pool play will be great we'll get like a one two seed uh, and a buy in the first round of bracket play and then like that third game has been eh, kind of all year and this weekend i was happy because we went like 
won our first two games, played really well, got the four seed, uh, got a tough draw. We had to play an 8 a.m. game on a Saturday, but like came focused, won that game um, in what was a close game. And then we were set up then pretty well for the rest of the tournament. Um, and that I had my probably number two guy who could throw in my fourth game. So he threw, did not throw particularly well. And it was just like we had, I mean, we, I tell everybody that this is the case with any baseball team, but my team, especially when they play clean defense, we can beat anybody. But as soon as we like make an error or two, it's just very difficult to win. So we had almost no errors all week weekend. And then that fourth game had a couple in a row and it's just like law of averages. You're going to have, you know, a handful during the weekend. It's just, can you space them out? Or are they all going to come at once? And all of ours came at once. Yeah. Um, and so we lost in the semifinal, but, uh, I mean, overall, like I said, I was pretty happy with how they played. Um, my last game just got kind of ugly. I think we were kind of out of gas. It was hot. Um, it was like our second game that day and fourth game of the weekend. But um, overall, I think I thought we played pretty well. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about is uh, we had a situation come up where, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but we were beating a team pretty well. Um, I want to say it was maybe six or more runs. And they kind of, I don't want to say they started a rally, but they got some base runners on in this uh, one particular inning. And so they had runners at first and third with one out. And the kid on first base was clearly not a fast kid. He was not a base stealer. Uh, but is it, is it faux pas to call someone slow nowadays? Like, is that going to get angry? Yeah, he was angry fat though? and slow. Um, <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I think they just thought we were going to, like, give them a base because my catcher looked over me to run our first and third play, and I like leaned over my assistant coach. I was like, "We're for sure gonna throw here through here. Like, we're I'll rather t I'll sacrifice a run for an out for sure." And so he he like gives a call to the infield, and then sure enough, kid takes off. I'm watching the kid at third because I'm expecting him to break. He doesn't break. He's like walking back to the maybe it was a miscommunication. I don't know. He's walking back to the bag, and then the kid at wasn't even my best throwing catcher. The kid at second base gets hosed by like two steps, and I was like. Thanks for the free out. Now, instead of first and third and one out, it's runner on third and two outs, which I always preach to my guys um, when we're ahead like that, like outs become more valuable than runs. So it's like outs, outs, outs. We just need outs in any way we can get them. Um, and that was like a freebie. And so I thought that was pretty interesting. I don't know. Maybe it was a miscommunication where the kid wasn't supposed to steal or the yeah. runner on third didn't break, but it was really dumb. Um, and it, it took the pressure off of us in that inning where it's like, especially at 13U, stuff can get out of control really fast with their little men, with their little psyches. So um, that was that was great for us. But it, it's like stuff like that's been happening kind of over the place. And we've, we've been guilty of it and we've not gotten caught where we've been – up big or down big and taking like one uh, particular game, we were down by like six again and my runners were just like taking all these bases. And I was like, okay, well great. But why, why are you running the risk of getting thrown out? Like I had a kid who stole second base. Uh, I was like, oh, okay. And then he stole third on the next pitch. And granted the, the pitcher was not uh, checking him, but I was like, we're down by six runs. You're, you mean nothing. Like we just need you yeah. not to get out. And so that was, and it's like stealing third with one out, like, okay, great, I guess. I don't know. It was kind of bizarre, but you just like teaching guys how to play well, with stealing leads. Stealing third or, with one out is a good time. Not if you're down by six runs. You're, no, no, I've never done my six. You're right. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so just like teaching them kind of the value of runs versus outs, depending on the game situation has been fascinating. Like they just don't, don't seem to get it yet. But again, they're 13. Yeah, the, uh, the whole base to base thing when you're, down by multiple is uh is an important yeah. concept especially when it's a, a really late inning like we've got to bat you home so but we've been doing we have been doing an excellent job of the last two weekends of uh like going to first or third on a base hit like guys have been really good about that um because we i think we've referenced in a past podcast basically talking about when when there's a let's say there's a guy on first and a base hit and you're as a base runner, you're running a second base and you're looking at your outfielder. Basically, if he has to move outside of his cone of influence, basically right in front of him, then you're free to go. But almost at 13, you even even if it's hit in front of him, they're so slow and they throw so slow that a lot of my guys have been taking it even when balls are hit like softly right at a guy. So um, they've done a pretty good job of reading that uh, and make, taking that extra base, which has been nice. I think it's kind of demoralizing on the other team when you're like flying around the bases. Yeah, I, I, as I watched your 13, you it seemed. Like, you could easily kind of just keep running. but mm -hmm. And I think at 15U and above, it starts to get better. But, yeah. like, 14U seems weird where 
they can't get their first to third that easily. I feel like because they're not that they're still at that age where they're not that fast, but the field being bigger really makes it a longer run, and the arms are still comparable. Whereas at fifteen, you everyone gets faster, mm-hmm. and I feel like they can get first to third. But I've just been there are definitely times where we could have done it, and we didn't, and uh, I was on our guys a little bit about it, but. I also felt like a lot of the time it was going to be kind of a stretch for them to get there where mm-hmm. the arms like from 13 you to 14 you arms definitely bump up a lot for sure but base running speed not so much maybe and then i think from 14 to 15 we hit that other they start getting deeper into puberty they start to get a lot faster and then first to third like they do have to make a really good throw to get a guy because they're fast enough to, to really get over yeah there. like but you said it's their their second year, or at least their first and a half year of 6090. So, like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, that makes a big difference, too. That, this was our first weekend and only weekend where we, we played 6090. And I was actually surprised by how little it affected our play. I mean, there are definitely spots that my arms on the left side just aren't strong enough to play at 6090 most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but our pitchers dealt fine with it pretty much. So, there wasn't, wasn't like a, I saw a big spike in walks. Like, they're all pretty much the same. So, yeah. that was good. My base runners did say at first, like their first couple games, were like, "Oh my gosh, it feels like I'm an eternity." There. Why am I not there yet? Yeah, but they got over it pretty quickly. So, yeah. Uh, another sort of base running slash coaching decision I wanted to talk to you about is la yesterday. Um, I was getting a live feed from the sectional semifinal of like local softball teams, and uh, the. Situation in reference was bottom of the seventh and a 1-1 tie with the offensive team. The hitting team obviously had a a runner on third, and there was one out. So winning run on third, one out, bottom of the seventh. And the girl pitching walks, unintentionally, walks a runner to first. So now it's first and third and one out. To which, as I'm hearing this live feed, I'm like, oh, well, in this situation, you walk, the base is loaded. Um, and I happened to have like a little hitter in the cage with me at the time. Um, and we started like talking about why that would be the case because his first reaction was like, why you never want to load the base. Loading the bases is the worst thing in the world. Uh, but in that situation, there's one run loses the game for you. But, uh, especially like in softball when, cause in that situation, okay, you go first and third, you don't walk the girl. So now it's first and third, one out and a ground ball, depending on the speed of the runner at third base, a ground ball to almost any part of the field wins the game, unless they probably had their left side in, but ground ball right side, certainly. Uh, versus if you walk, intentionally walk one more hitter, and now you have the bases loaded, now you have a force at any base, particularly you have a force at home, so you can bring the infield in, and any ground ball does not win the game. It prolongs your life, essentially, one more batter. And they didn't, they failed to do that. They did not do that, and I think it was a ground ball that lost the game, like a little ground ball or a single. I don't know if it was what it was, but... Um, I just thought that was a big, not a big misstep, but an interesting decision not to walk that hitter. Well, with like, you know, obviously with one out with two outs, it makes a little bigger difference. Well, it also depends on how relevant the double play is. It depends on the age, Um, right? You know, in major league baseball or just high levels of baseball, you walk the bases loaded because the ground ball that's hit hard in the infield is going to become a double play. So the inning is going to be over. You don't have to worry about that guy. Now, if it's, First and third, and it's a team like whether it's softball or it's baseball where they're, the double play is less sure, they have to go home regardless. So it's they have an easier time. Obviously, they just get a force at home. So if they have to take a little longer, they can still unload a throw of the plate, catch, you know, automatic out with the force. They don't have to put a tag down. So it makes it a little bit easier, but a little less cut and dry, I think, in that situation. Yeah, and I don't know what the where they were in the order. Like if the nine hitter's up, you intentionally walk the nine hitter to get the one hitter? Probably not. So a lot there were a lot of variables, but I just thought that was interesting. Yeah. If it were me, I probably would have walked the bases loaded, yeah. just to give myself that extra option. Yeah, and for me, it depends. It also depends just on the pitcher. I mean, I can't trust the guy to not walk in a run. Mm-hmm. And it depends on how good his stuff is. So obviously, there's a base open, first and third. The guy's going to steal on the first or second pitch anyway. So now it's second and third. So now I can pitch him really tough if I'm smart. Mm-hmm. You know, he can get the 2-0 slider in the dirt, whatever, and he can take his chances on it. So you have a, a pretty good chance to pitch him the way you want. Which you could do that. They could have done that. They could have been trying to do that, too, with a runner on first and third and one out, just like pecking I mean, corners. It's basically and, a yeah, base open situation there. Just yeah. pushing them over doesn't matter. With the bases loaded, you could usually just 
plug a guy and I don't know. It's it, it, it definitely is easier to get that out of the plate with the bases loaded. Uh, and I don't know. Do they turn one, I, I, one two, three double plays in softball? I don't think they, they turn double plays that pitcher. much in, in softball. Yeah, probably not. They're, all, they're what, at first base in two seconds? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's fast Point girls three. are sub three. Yeah, but it's very fast. Yeah, that could have been the other thing. Maybe there's just some super fast girl at the plate. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, there's that one's – not super cut and dry, but I th- I, I'm pro walking the bases, I think, as well. But not the way we went last week. We walked a lot, way too many guys, so it's kind of tough to want to put yourself in that situation. And then that was your first experience with the California tiebreaker, right? What do you think of that? Oh, yeah, the extra innings runner on second, one out, for one on one count on every hitter. Yep. Uh, I think baseball is really boring. It's way exciting. It's far way, way more exciting. Well, I think it's boring in general, and I I hate playing extra innings more than anything in the whole world. So mm-hmm. I'm kind mm-hmm. of for it because I want the game to end. I love that. I sounds think bad, but actually, like, I think I just got wounded like as a as a person in my soul from playing extra inning games too much as a relief pitcher. As a relief pitcher, you're just like this is just agonizing. I'm not part of this game. It could go on forever. Well, and I just like. As a reliever, you're just trying to hold on. There's not like the excitement on your side. It's really just more like a pressure side. Just don't blow it. Just, just don't, don't blow, blow it. the game. Like that's your that's your goal. Just not blow it. Uh, I just am extremely extra inning averse. That's just me personally. I just I hate them. I am so, too. And and especially in pool play games, like, I mean, it, this is gonna sound bad, but it, the win loss doesn't matter. Like I'm more concerned with preserving arms than I am about win loss. Well, that's that's true. Too. So it's like get this thing over with. I don't care if we win or lose. I just don't want to burn four different pitchers. And you had to burn a lot of pitchers in that game, but... Yeah, we had two extra inning games this weekend. We played four total, four or five of those little mini innings total. Um, so, yeah, I, I would rather just come to a decision faster. So I like the California thing. It's great. Because of that. It's like two outs. I mean, you could have an out and you have that inning in four pitches. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's like, I mean, pit, your pitcher throws one strike and now it's one two. It's like, whoa, this is great. Yeah, so if you have an out pitch, it gets pretty easy for you. Mm-hmm. Um, it definitely made, speeds things up a little bit. Yeah, so I'm I'm a fan of it. I like I said, I just oh, extra inning games are just. Uh, Especially, there's nothing worse than playing several extra innings and then losing. Like it's just like <laughs> that's the worst thing in the world. Uh, we could have done this a while ago. Yeah, let's just get it over with. So, yeah, no, and yeah, like you said, and the bullpen thing, especially as a as a bullpen pitcher, like extra inning games, they keep going on. They just ruin your whole. They just ruin your whole team. They mess everything up. Yeah. Because obviously in the big leagues they'll just call guys up if they need to if they have a bunch of killed arms, but you know an independent ball or depending on where you are in the minor leagues, if you just everyone has everyone throws one night because you play 14 innings, you're all just wearing it the next day too, and just the next day and the next day until you get to an off day you don't really catch up until because if everyone throws one night, then the next night next night three or four guys are throwing again. Now they have gone two in a row. And then it just like it spirals out of control where everyone gets very depleted. I mean, it can happen really quick on one th- one day, or if you get rained out, you have a date, a t- you know, a double header, and that crushes people's arms because usually you have to have a spot starter from the bullpen, or you Johnny Holstaff it. So rain outs and extra innings for guys who played in college or professional baseball, mostly pro, where you play almost every day, it, they just like wear you out, and they just are just like the worst thing in the world. Yeah, just terrible. So nothing good comes from them. So yeah, California rules, thumbs up. Pro California rules, thumbs up. Speaking of rainouts, it's raining right now. We better not get rained out. We're supposed to play at the in the Brad Wallen tournament here. Uh, well, this evening, we better not get rained out. I'll be very salty about it. About that. Do you, do you guys play? Are you guys play tonight? We play tonight. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know what they're gonna do if we get rained out, but it's it's raining pretty hard. There's I don't know if it's raining where where that six, game is. Sixty one teams in our division. Play. Do you know how many there are in thir- in fourteen? You forty something. Yeah, there's. Oy, oy, oy. That would be a nightmare. Yeah, so I'm sure they don't want to lose it. And I don't really want to lose the game either because single games, that's the one thing I do like about amateur baseball. Hour and 45-minute time rule, time limit. I don't care about the time limit so much, but it's just nice not having like an eight-hour day every day. <laughs> yeah. Get to the ballpark at 2.30, go home at 10, four hours of pregame for a three-hour game. It gets old. Yeah. So the one-hour pregame, one hour and change, the game is just going to be a fixed amount for the most part. We played a four extra inning game this past weekend, 
and it took two and a half hours, and the kids were like, that was the longest game ever. I'm like, that's the shortest game <laughs> ever. The shortest if game it's ever. college or professional, like nine inning games in two and a half hours is flying. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. So I'm all about the, the quicker doses of baseball in general. Absolutely. But so let's, let's merge into talking about um, – so we've hit on this in the past. What are some inappropriate exercises that you see for young ball players? So for right now, we have all of our kids flooding back in our facility, and a lot of them already do, quote, unquote, lifting at school. And obviously, it, depending on the school and depending on the coaches, there are some excellent, well-run school strength programs. And then there are also many of them are, that are horrendous, that are run by people that don't supervise, don't know a single thing, uh, that are terrible. Yeah. Or their workout programs are still from the 1980s. Or it seems like a lot of football workouts, quote unquote, can, or exist basically just of, or consist basically just of bench, push press, squats. And maybe deadlifts. Like, it's just very extremely basic, which you can get very strong on the basics. However, these are usually poorly coached basics as well. Yeah. So, when people talk about, all oh, like, lifting, I, like, I lift all the time. I don't get much bigger. Or lifting doesn't work that well. Like everyone talk, But usually it's because they're doing a program like that that's poorly supervised. Range of motion is poorly enforced. And just in general, not, like, the right thing for a young, growing athlete. So, I'll let you start. Yeah, there's this could get dangerously long. Uh, I will start with probably my least favorite exercise for baseball players, and then I would say a lot of athletes in general, and that is the bench. Um, I just don't, and I, depending on where you get your information on the internet, you'll see this talked about all the time, yet the bench continues to be insidious, and in every high school workout program that's, like you said, from 1985 or whatever, um, but I don't like bench for a couple different reasons. The first of which is it's a very, it's subtly a technically difficult lift. So if you don't know what you're doing, so if you're a 15 year old high school baseball player and you don't know what you're doing and you don't have a coach who's really good at teaching you how to bench, you can bench really poorly. And so that just means basically the most important thing when you're benching, especially if you're an overhead athlete, so you're playing volleyball or baseball or tennis, is you have to be able to set your shoulder in the right place in your little socket. So the way your shoulder works is you have a socket and you have a ball and it's supposed to stay in the middle and roll around. But when you're benching, what gets most kids do is they, their shoulder comes out of place. So their shoulder comes too far forward and now they're in an unstable position and then you're adding load to it. So you're putting a barbell on their hands. So they're just grinding their shoulder as they're doing this bench. Um, and it becomes pretty injurious pretty quickly on top of that. It's not really even all that functional of a lift. So, uh, pressing can be important, right? We have to have a balance of, of pushing weight away from us and bringing it closer to us. But I just think the bench is kind of an overrated exercise. We do it with some of our athletes just for variation more than anything. But um, rather, uh, you could easily do a like a dumbbell bench, which is going to be similar in terms of benefit of, of a press variation, but there's a dynamic like shoulder stability component. So you have a, an open-ended exercise essentially where the dumbbell can move around. So you have to be really stable as you go through the range of motion. Um, but bench continues to be like meat and potatoes lift for everybody. Um, despite the fact that no matter how strong you are in, in bench, when you then go to play a sport, you can only bench or you can only shove someone like 40% of your body weight. So even if I bench 405 pounds, I'm only going to be able to push you for 120 worth because that's how much I weigh. So, um, I don't know. I think that's, that's probably the first one I think of when I think of inappropriate lifts that just get done everywhere. Um, and it's, it's like, like I said, it, it takes someone who knows what they're doing to coach it well about, you know, loading your scaps and keeping your, your back tight. And so what a lot of coaches will do is they'll just do like the uh, board bench. So putting boards on your chest to like limit the range of motion. But then I'm like, what's the point? Like that, that's now I'm shortening the range of motion. So now it's like, it's serving no real purpose. So that's the first one I got. Yeah. Um, everyone really loves the deadlift, but the deadlifts are kind of, kind of unsafe. They're, they're fine. There's a million different exercises to get your back strong and your legs strong and your butt strong and your hamstring strong, but straight bar deadlifts, we like don't do with very many athletes. Uh, you need a lot of hip mobility to get down there to get the bar to have your chest up, to have a flat back. So that's a limitation for a lot of people. And what you see with most young players is they don't have the back development, so their back's not thick enough to really help support their spine. 
and they end up rounding their back over to get down to the bar and they don't have good spine mechanics. So, you know, when you have a group of poorly supervised high school athletes, whether they're male or female, and they're all doing deadlifts in a group, that's just a terrible recipe. I mean, we don't, we don't have kids doing much and we're like very much on top of them, like watching and supervising and teaching and even in our much more supervised group, it's still like tough for us to be on them every set where they really need a lot of coaching to, to get their, their back in a proper position. So, you know, people just talk about, oh, deadlifts are so great for getting strong, and they are. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you have to be like the right person. I think you need a certain amount of meat, a certain amount of meat on your back to squat really safely and to deadlift safely. And uh, it's the learning curve, like starting off, with a deadlift to build that meat, like the deadlift is the best one of the best ones to build your back musculature, but there's just other ways to build it first and then go up there later. And there's other variations like the, the RDL, which is a partial motion range of motion deadlift, which is more hamstring dominant. Uh, those are probably more relevant for athletes anyway, because you're never that deep of a knee bend for deadlifts. Now, I don't really love that argument in general because you could apply it to a lot of stuff and say go partial range of motion, but um yeah i could RDLs and then there's trap deadlifts which are more quad they're more like a squat but they get most of the same benefits as a straight bar deadlift and yeah i would i would say that's what i was going to say is that anything i can any benefit i can drive from a straight bar deadlift i can get from an rd combination of rdls and, and trap bar deadlift and trap bar deadlift is going to put you in a slightly better uh spinal position where your back's a little more upright so it's just like those those two lists in combination are, are far superior, I th- I, in my opinion, for younger athletes. Plus, on top of the fact that one of the things, one of the big knocks against deadlifts in terms of, because it, it, it is a dangerous lift, um, every other lift starts loaded. And by that, I mean, like, when, you, when you're benching, you have to unrack the bar, so you feel how heavy the bar is when you unrack it. When you're squatting, you have to unrack the bar. When you are doing a dumbbell lift, you have to pick up the dumbbells. But in a deadlift, the weight's starting on the ground, and your first movement is the movement of the exercise. And so you can really underestimate how heavy it is and that's when you can hurt you hurt your back really yeah. really bad your back um, poops out and so yeah deadlift for for most athletes just like isn't worth the the cost benefits not there especially when rdls exist and trap bar deadlifts exist like yeah and that was like one thing that you've always said is there's no there's no exercise that's so awesome for you that it has to be in every program like that's just not a no. thing like there's so many different variations to hit like you said if, am I doing deadlift for grip strength? I can do something else. Am I doing it for hamstring development, for lower back development, for, you know, explosiveness? I don't know. There's, I can do it for, there's other things I can do that are way safer. Yeah, and, we, and we've written strength programs for different high schools around the country. We almost never, I mean, not almost, we literally never put in straight bar deadlifts because they're just not the most appropriate. Yeah. Cause, and when you're programming for a group where I'm not going to be there, he's not going to be there so we have to just leave it up to the supervisor that we maybe don't know that well or we do know him well but you just want to give him the best possible chance of having everyone safe on every lift you just don't put in uh art you don't put in deadlifts you don't put in bench press you don't put in barbell rdl which is also a little bit technically tough at first to get it because kids have to hip hinge the hip hinge is not like a, a supernatural motion i mean it is but it isn't so they can really screw that up if they're not well supervised. What are some of the other ones? Um, we don't put um, in pull throughs because they're also difficult to get without coaching, without good coaching. Um, yeah, I mean that. W- those that's are like worth the big, the big bunch, I think. Yeah, I mean we don't do we don't program Olympic lifts for the same nope. reason. They're just like nope. learning curve is way too steep. Yep. So, and, and I would say like just a kind of that point's worth uh, reiterating that yeah that that hip hinge movement is so great for so many things, but it's, it's not super intuitive. And especially if you have a weak back, like there's, you have to, you have to do some work to bolster a kid's hamstrings in their back in order for them just to have the kind of prerequisite strength it takes to do a really, really good hip hinge. And like you said, if you're not really well supervised and you just give a kid a, a bar with 95 pounds on it, you say, okay, do an RDL. It looks like this. The very few are going to get it crush it on their first rep. Like it's yeah. just hard to learn. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we always err on the side of caution. So, like, rowing, even mm-hmm. you can't really hurt yourself doing a row. Yeah, you, you, can, can, you, can, you can do it not perfect. but Yeah, you can do a bad row, but it's, it's going to be safe, gonna and you're you. still going to get something out of it. Yeah, same thing with, like, a lot of hip thrust variations, even with the barbell on your lap. 
you know, the bar has got to go up and it's got to come back down. And you can do it kind of right. You can do it right or you can do it wrong, but you're just still going to get something out of it with your hamstring and glutes, even if you're not perfect. And if you do it wrong, you're just, I don't know if you've ever had an injury from like hip thrusts. No, no chance. Uh, and we have a, a infinitesimally small injury rate anyway from our lifting program. But I think that's partially just because of the way we like we do it, like the stuff that could really hurt you. It's just like not that important because I don't want to have to feel like as I'm going through the gym, I have to be constantly like head on a swivel because if I'm not watching little Johnny do the next set of his next thing, he could hurt him. He could blow up on every second and any second. It's like you need to give people autonomy too, where they can learn to live without having to feel like they're, you have to coach them every five seconds so they can, you know, Hey, give them one or two pointers every time they do a set. So they get a little better at it, but you know, it's not gonna be perfect. Just like if you have a lesson with a kid, his swing is not going to go from zero to great in one lesson. So you can't really expect that for 15 exercises on a strength program either. Like they have to get better over time and you're going to introduce new ones, new variations, and they're going to have to get better over time. Yeah. So if everything you're giving them is always, you know, make or break, if their technique's not perfect, you're going to have a lot of broken kids, you know, that's kind of the thing. That's what I was going to say is I think what we've done a, a good job of is kind of systemized our, our onboarding process essentially where you give them kind of foolproof exercises early that you know are going to build up their um, exercise ability and their strength and their, their exercise tolerance. And then as you build that up, like you said, you're, then that's when you start introducing some of these more mm -hmm. complicated lifts that do have value, but just aren't like worth it or not, uh, not appropriate for younger athletes who are just learning how to lift. Yeah. Um, loaded carries is another one that is like, that's a good one to program early. Cause you just walk around with heavy stuff and it makes you stronger and it's hard to mess up mm -hmm. and sled pushes. Sled pushes are great. Um, we do, uh, like our squat progression is always starting with goblet squat. We're like, that's a, of all the different squat variations, when you're talking about like a back squat, which is a very dangerous lift, uh, even like front squats or, or some of these like specialty type bars, it all, it's really beneficial to start with a goblet squat where it's like, you just need a dumbbell. You can pin it against your chest. It's not going to, there's not a ton of axial load. There's not a lot of weight going through your spine. Uh, but that's how you can like load a squat and really learn how to squat with, with some mm -hmm. weight on you. Yeah. We do a lot of that kind of stuff and then a lot of rowing. So they start to build some muscle on their back, which then will protect them when they do go to front squats from goblet squats. And then front squats will build their back some more as they're building their back. Then finally, months on the road, they graduate to like, you know, back squats, and uh, which is like the standard one to do in a typical 1990s workout or whatever yeah. from back in the day. So. And, you know, to get back to your point, when you ask, you know, what's an appro appropriate or not appropriate list for baseball players, I think that's another reason we do so much rowing is kids in general, whether they play sports or not, are almost always front side dominant. So their quads are stronger than their hamstrings and their butt, their shoulders are forward, like they have rounded posture. And so then on top of that, if you stack on that, they're a baseball or a softball or a volleyball player. And now a lot of they, a lot of the athletic movements they do are in the front. Then they, those people get extra, extra rounded. So we try to do a ton of rowing just to kind of pull back pe people back into balance mm -hmm. where, like you said, it's just like, you can never have a strong enough back. It's safe, safe to do. Um, and all those kids need it anyway. Cause they're just, they're on their phones and sitting in class like this all the time podcast listeners my shoulders are forward guys yeah so you know that's that's pretty much it if you strengthen people's hamstrings you strengthen their back they're capable of doing many 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 more lifts with good form and those just kind of help bolster their joints and their spine and all that stuff and then you're just a lot safer than you were even with the same form that you had because if you have a big strong back your spine's gonna be protected it's like the bodyguard for it so it all kind of ties together but, you know, the other, the other bone to pick I have with a lot of these lifting programs at school is that they're just like there's no arm care program in there. So, you know, even if you're doing a great job supervising all those main lifts, for, like, baseball players, they need to have some dedicated arm strengthening because it's just they use it so much. Often it's not done at the field. And even with our kids, like, they don't want to do it at the field. Like, they're very lazy. So it has to be done in their program. I shouldn't say they're very lazy, but it's just a tedious thing to do. It's mm -hmm. a tedious thing. So you have to get it. You have to get repetition with it too. It can't just be like once in a while. It needs to be constant, so they can slowly build up that protection. Because shoulder injuries are more preventable than they ever have been. Elbow injuries are not. And really, this the amount of strengthening you do for your shoulder and your overall body, and the harder you throw, actually exposes your elbow to more risk. So it's kind of a weird catch twenty two that 
the more shoulder care and the more performance enhancement you do for your throwing, the more likely your elbow is probably to end up the short, the just the weak link. It's not really like you're making yourself more susceptible. It's just of all the links in your big chain that you can strengthen and make thicker and stronger, the elbow is one you can't. Mm. So you can prevent labrum, labrum surgery and rotate, rotator cuff surgery to a very high degree. Those shoulder injuries have dropped off tremendously in baseball and softball, but elbow injuries have not. Yeah. So at the very least, <laughs> don't go down with a rotator cuff or a labrum. I mean, well, that's what I was going to say. You can prevent it by putting in the time. Yeah, and the the excuse, there is no excuse to not have dedicated shoulder stuff in a program because it's so like you go online and Google like rotator cuff exercises, and there's about a million different exercises you can do. A lot of which are pretty pretty foolproof. Um, I mean, you go, you Google Blackburns or prone tees or whatever, and there's just so many easy exercises to do that Mm -hmm. there's no reason for them not to be in a, in a program because they're so, so beneficial and so easy. It's like, it's a no brainer. Yeah. But you know, it's tough to do them at the field. Like you can't just, Mm -hmm. you can't only have it at the field because even with us kids get, they're just ready to play. They're bored of it in a, in a hurry after the game. You're not going to keep them there for 20 minutes to arm care. It's just unrealistic most of the time. So you know, we fight that too. So it just needs to be part of like the separate strength workout. It needs to be integrated in. Yeah. Cause so, it's, cause that's their time to like get that stuff done. Just, we did the same thing we do with our eyeball players and like our, their hips. It's like, if I had my way, all volleyball players would own minivans and they do hip stuff at home, but no one wants to do hip stuff at home. Yeah, so do it in dedicate time to it in a, in a strength conditioning workout and you're set. Yeah. And it's easy to add in there. So if you're a coach and you're listening, just like they're going to do deadlift bench and whatever, like if that's just what they're going to do, fine. But they could do deadlift and they could do, you know, external rotations, superset. So they do a set of squats, they do a set of uh, external rotations, and they go into their deadlifts. They do a set of deadlifts, they do a set of pull apart tees for their retractors. They go to their bench press, they do a set of bench press, and they do a set of, uh, you know, prone wise, mm-hmm. whatever it is. And they just superset them, and now it's like folded, it's mixed into the regular workout. And yeah, you're going to have active rest. Health, healthier players through active rest. Yeah, so not too tough but pretty decent little podcast here today on this rainy afternoon hopefully the audio didn't get too bad yeah it started raining and it got by. pretty uh tough but you have to live with it so yeah deal with it yeah suck it up <laughs> all right that's it for uh twinsies episode all right, make sure you follow us social media snapchat instagram facebook uh also message us from uh, through our facebook page or i'm sorry through our warburgacademy.com page yeah We've got facebook messenger linked it's very you can cool. bug us 24 hours you can a bug day us anytime you want yeah <laughs> so all right see you next week see ya